Thank you, David, for being here and joining us tonight. Thank you, audience and Facebook Live audience. Um, we could have no better expert to speak about this painting than David and Pham. I'm going to start by telling you my history with Rothko. I was a curator for 30 years at the Guggenheim Museum. My very first day on the job, I walked onto the ramps because we were starting the installation of a Mark Rothko retrospective. And I came to tell my boss, Diane Waldman, a great curator, that I was there to report for duty. And she looked at me and she said, OK, great, you're here. And she was looking across the ramp at two Rothkos from 1957. And she said to me, do you think they're good like that, or should we reverse them? And I thought, oh my god, I've died and gone to heaven. I am a curatorial assistant being asked my opinion on installing Rothkos at the Guggenheim Museum. So what do I say? I say, uh, I guess we should try it. We tried it. She goes, good, uh, go back to your office. And then I didn't see her again for three weeks until the exhibition opened. It was such a great pleasure to spend three months in that beautiful temple that the Guggenheim Museum is with these sublime paintings. So I really feel that Rothko is in my soul, not quite as much as you have Rothko in your soul. And I wanted to start tonight by asking you or telling everyone that this is an old friend, this painting of David's, because he actually included it in another monumental exhibition that preceded your show at the Royal Academy in New York in 2008 at Haunch of Venison Galleries. And it was a show called Abstract Expressionism, A World Elsewhere. And you had about 62 works in the show. It was revelatory. It was just a show that everyone flocked to see. And this painting was in the show. So how did you first come to see this beautiful work? And how did you decide to include it in the exhibition? Well, it's actually an even older friend than you might think, Lisa, because I first saw this painting of memory serves very early on in the research for the Rothko catalogue, Raisin of Works on Canvas, and that takes me back down memory lane, I think, to 1989, which works out to exactly 30 years ago. There's one thing about this work. It's five foot nine inches high. 69. And I was thinking about that today, and that's your average male height. And this may sound a bit frivolous, but it's not at all, because Rothko was very interested in what he called intimate scale. And in 1951, he made a statement for the Museum of Modern Art, where he said, usually large pictures are meant to be very pompous and expensive grandiose, heroic, and all that. But he said, the reason I paint large pictures is because I want to be very intimate and human. And this desire for human scale is very, very important. That is fabulous. Now, we're going to get back to that point, but I just want to tell for our Facebook Live audience and our audience here why we are sitting in front of this gorgeous picture. I don't know why our backs are to it, but we're going to manage. Um, we, Sotheby's is fortunate that we will be able to offer this painting in our May sales on May 16th, to be precise, evening sale in New York as one of its supreme highlights. The painting is being sold by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art to benefit their acquisition fund. This is an interesting story for those of you who don't know the provenance of how it came to that collection. Um, Peggy Guggenheim, and that's another connection I have, of course, to Rothko, was, as we know, someone who really discovered the artists of the abstract expressionist generation, giving many of them their first shows. And indeed, at her Art of the Century Gallery in 1945, she gave Rothko an exhibition. She donated a painting um, in 1946, one of his most ambitious early surrealist works called Slow Swirl at the Edge of the Sea to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. This painting actually didn't stay at the San Francisco Museum. It was there until 1962 when Rothko, in exchange, gave this gorgeous canvas from 1960 from his own collection, obviously, to the museum where it has remained since. The slow swirl at the edge of the sea is now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. So we have a very storied provenance here that bring together the artist, 
Peggy Guggenheim, one of the great, great champions of the art of this period, of the art of our century or last century, and uh, you know, really tells, the, tells such a wonderful story. Um, but as David said, this work has a very human scale, and the San Francisco Museum happens to have Rothko's from every decade, including an enormous and more monumentally scaled painting from 1960, which means that this painting can now find another home, and I'm sure it will find a fabulous home. But 1960 is a very, very significant year in his production, falling as it does between two really important commissions. One being the Seagram's murals in 1958 and 59. No. Thank you. I have to Thank keep you. those dates. Somewhere. Keep those yes. dates. And, <laughs> and the Menil Chapel, which comes slightly later in the 60s, um, 65, 60, 65, 67. So 1960 is an interesting moment, and this painting partakes of a little bit of the Seagram's mural, a little bit of the Menil Chapel works, but yet has its own character and spirit. Um, but I think it's a year worth evaluating and reevaluating. Now, in the very year that this painting was done, 1960, Rothko wrote in response to a collection question from the then Tate Gallery collector, Ronald Alley asking him to say something about the Seagrams, in fact. And Rothko replied memorably, saying that the dark pictures had begun in 1957 and have continued almost compulsively to this day, that is 1960. And here there's something to be said about the darker pictures because I think that Rothko, as the 50s wore on, and his style started to change crucially in 55, it became heavier and denser. He saw the bright paintings as perhaps a little bit too easy, and he wanted this resistance from something that audiences could immediately come to outright, for something with more gravitas and weight, something in a sense which he saw as more profound and as he said, something which expresses, expresses excuse me, um, basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom. Well, he began to find that, that darkness and depth with the Seagrams, as you said yourself, in 58, 59. It's interesting to recall that in, if memory serves, June 1959, Rothko set sail for Europe. It's a very important juncture because sometime around then, either just before he set sail, or certainly very soon after he came back that autumn, the Seagram's project had been called off. He didn't want to go any further with it. And he thought, realized that the setting of the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building was not an appropriately somber and lofty and spiritualized setting for his art. So we have these interesting junctures. We have 59, he goes to Europe. There, in Italy, he sees, um, he sees or re-sees, depending on how we uh, look at the itinerary of his first trip to Europe in 1950, above all, the Laurentian Chapel and Vestibule by Michelangelo in the library, San Lorenzo, the church in Florence. And that, that is a site which had impressed Rothko from very early on because there's a painting of the 1930s called Interior, which is absolutely crucial for the later work, because there in Interior, you have for the first time the rectangular, frontal, architectonic setting that ultimately, a decade or more later, Rothko would turn into the armature, the whole structure of his classic works. So he goes back to Europe, he sees Michelangelo's architecture, which he admits is an influence on him, he also, in Florence, visits um, the, the monastery of San Marco, where the um, Fra Angelica murals painted directly on the wall are, are very important from, for him. You go to San Marco, and what's interesting is the scale. You go from one little cloister to another, and there you have the murals, which are not grandiose at all. They're very, very intimate. 
because they're conceived for the monks. There is a site of, you know, meditation and spirituality. And there's another thing about 1960 you have to remember. Okay, he's come back from Europe. He's moved into a new brownstone with his wife, Mel. That's an important turning point. But above all else, he must, by that date in 1960, be aware that the Museum of Modern Art New York has decided to have a major retrospective of his work, which opens, if memory serves, on January the 18th, 1961. So, you see, 1960 is really a, a major turning point. I'd love to talk a second about the architecture of this picture, meaning stacked vans. Sometimes they're three, sometimes they're two, sometimes the format are squarer, but what do you think about that? And how does, I mean, it's so amazing that the creamy white band is at the bottom, but yet the painting remains in such perfect balance. What to me is compelling and you can only see it in hindsight when you study the progression from year to year, is that with the break with figuration, which starts decisively in 1946, through those years until 50, there is this almost obsessive resolution of the shapes, which he called at the time in the late 1940s, his actors. These resolve through the multiforms, which are quite as the word suggests, but it's not simple. And Rothko said to Ida Colmeyer, whom he was working with when he visited New Orleans, he said, if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing over and over again, making sure that people get it and understand it. And of course, repetition is not the same as repetitiveness. Repetitiveness is boring. If I go on for too long, or you go on for too long, we start to repeat ourselves and everyone's going to fall asleep in the audience. But no, repetition actually is very, very interesting. Because repetition really is at the core of musical structure. Mm -hmm. The way in which we have a melody, it evolves, it's repeated, there's a recapitulation, there's a coda. The whole idea of classical sonata form is about repetition in music. And Rothko was a great fan of music classical music, and this is where the brightness, or in this case, the more penumbral quality of a painting, it's very important for what it almost says. And um, Rothko famously once stated, silence is so accurate. And um, sitting here now, I have that very odd feeling of something behind me. And I, I remember reading about a book of psychology. Imagine, Imagine someone staring at your neck from behind. And there's this, this very interesting sense of presence and absence. And coming back to this notion of size and touch is very important. Because scale is not the same as size. Size is something you can measure with a tape measure and a ruler. But scale is how you perceive dimensions. You can have something small that looks big. And on the other hand, you can have big things which look trivial or petty or small. And scale in Rothko's paintings is all important. And this is why I insisted on trying to see every single one of the paintings that went into the catalogue recently. And it was only by the actual experience of encountering them that one gets a hands-on sense of what touch is about. Totally agree, and, I, and Rothko famously said, the paint, a painting is not the picture of an experience. It is the experience. You can feel spiritual about things just in an everyday sense. I mean, I, I, I'm not a religious person at all, but I still get these moments, especially listening to music and or whatever, of something that's just uncanny, otherworldly, in the world with you. And as I think it's that kind of spirituality which is extremely important to Rothko. And of course, don't forget that I mentioned presence and absence because the rectangles and the frontality are very, very interesting. The point about the rectangles is that they are once very, very frontal and they, you know, hit you head on, you know, the colours, the, the planarity. But there is, throughout Rothko, this persistent sense that there's something behind the rectangles. 
They sort of simultaneously emit light and absorb light. Yes, and also presence, the paintings are there, as I've said. I can feel it behind me right now. Right. Rothko said, uh, some painters prefer to tell all, but I prefer to tell little. My paintings are sometimes described as facades, and indeed they are facades. The very concept of a facade, apart from being architectonic, facades both proclaim that what's up front, but they also conceal. And if you say to someone they're putting up a facade, it means there's more to it than meets the eye. And this notion of concealment and revelation is very central to Rothko's work. How has, um, how has our understanding, your under, you've been dealing with Rothko for a long time, I've obviously. Too, too long, too long. Too, not, never too <laughs> long. Um, and I, I too have experienced these paintings for a very long time. But how, how does art history, scholarship, what, how has that changed over the years in terms of understanding or rereading Rothko's work? Scholarship certainly has changed, but I'm not, I'm not interested now in talking about the methodologies of art history. I mean, that's an academic subject, it's very important. Rothko is one of those artists who, in retrospect, has made it impossible to write the history of modern art without him. And to really zero back to your question, now we can see that the 20 years of phenomenal activity from 1950 to 1970, that was in a way the culmination of what Rothko had been trying to express in the previous 20 years with his pictures of the figure entrapped by architecture alone, uh, tableau of solitude if you like. And so the beauty of Rothko's Abex signature style is that you've got the emotions of the early work, the anxiety, the uplift, the contraction, the sense of claustrophobia, the sense of release and so on. You've got all that, but all the figurative superstructure has been jettisoned. So you're looking at ess essences. Essences, that is such a great word. I keep writing down words when I look at Rothko's, um, you know, luminous, ethereal, reverberating, pulsating, subtle, tonal, intellectual, refined, but essences is like the best word. And the last point which people must notice there, this is about Rothko's sense of touch. You look very closely at the lower rectangle, the ivory white rectangle, and between its lower termination and the edge of the canvas, there is an incredibly faint, but absolutely deliberate, snowstorm of little speckles of white. And I know it's deliberate because they do not go around the sides. They're nowhere else in the painting. And almost like Seurat's dots, they blend optically into this rather mysterious, subdued, muted gray ground. And um, I think Rothko did that by speckling the stiff brush. You know something he did? Yes, a very, very fine spray. He certainly didn't use a spray gun. And it's those details which make this painting extremely assured, assured. He knew exactly what he was doing. He's got everything in place. Behind the colour lies a cataclysm. This notion of concealment and of enormous pressures underneath the tranquil surface. And you know, there's a phrase from Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy, a book which meant a lot to Rothko early on tranquility tinged with terror. And there's this element of anxiety, of pressures, claustrophobia, brooding. He said to David Sylvester, um, I'm trying to capture the feeling you sometimes get at dusk or nightfall as a feeling of mystery in the air. This painting is staring at me and listening to me behind my back. It's got all those qualities. Mm -hmm.